Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Sewing is a ubiquitous fact visible in many objects that surround our daily life, and it's an increasingly mysterious talent that is falling out of modern awareness. As I prepared for today's episode, I searched through the more than 2,500 dreams submitted to us from listeners, not one mentioned sewing. And yet we are surrounded by artifacts from sewers. The leather seats in your car were sewn together. The shirt you're wearing right now was sewn from pieces into a hole. Designers envisioned the dress you're wearing and passed their patterns to stitchers who brought it to life, sewing repairs and creates, and the objects it creates hold moments in time, visible in the fashions of the various periods uh, in the U.S. I mean, I just lost myself, Paul. I'm going to try that again. Sewing repairs and creates, and the objects it creates hold moments in time visible in the quilts passed down from generations made from pieces of wedding gowns and a baby's pajamas to the AIDS quilts, stitching memories of loved ones into a symbolic tapestry. Today, Deb and I will stitch together our session as our buddy Lisa is presenting a retreat out of the area. So let's explore sewing as a symbolic motif. I am intrigued by all that sewing holds and the, mm. the polarity you just mentioned about, it's very ordinary. We take it for granted. Every, so many things are sewn together uh, and we never see it happening. A lot of it happens overseas and yet there is something mysterious about it as well. And I'm thinking about some of my own experiences in sewing and how I have sewn into a quilt, for example, mm. um, a certain memory or a person, that it really does become a holder of, of memories. And I'm curious about what is, I have a long relationship with sewing, and yet you're the one who came up with this topic. It's not there in dreams. I'm curious about your experience with sewing and also, what on earth is going on here? It, well, you know, it's something that I think is in front of us all the time mm -hmm. that we don't think very often about. Yes. And, and, and therefore, it's archetypal because it's everywhere. And it's been around for like 30,000 years. Yes. It's visible in every culture. And it is a kind of ground that we all stand on and pay very little attention to unless we have... This is a hobby, perhaps, but I was unexpectedly introduced to sewing by my grandmother, <laughs> and uh, in Polish, that's babcia. So babcia was a, a Polish immigrant. She came to the United States, worked as a nanny, found her footing in one thing or another, but she really found her talent in sewing. And so she worked in the garment district in uh, Manhattan, and she was so talented that she was the one that the designers would hire to sew the clothing that would go on the runway. So she had this extremely meticulous understanding of how to make a garment in a really extraordinary way that she could bring the vision forward. And uh, my grandmother and I, <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard for me to find the words, but... Um, my grandmother had a really irascible, <laughs> primal personality, which was very difficult for certain members of my family. But Babcha and I just really understood each other. And so 
my parents would drop me off at her house for long weekends and they would just, you know, run off. And it was just me and Babja. And uh, she taught me how to cook, uh, taught me how to garden. She never mentioned sewing, but she had this sewing machine in her bedroom. And I knew that it was part of her life professionally. And then one day, it's as if I just discovered it. And asking her about it lit her up in this extraordinary way. It was clear that no one had taken an interest in this part of her life. And so very, very patiently, she taught me how to work the machine, how to do a little bit of sewing, how to repair something, how to fit a pair of pants, how to sew a button <laughs> on that had fallen off, how to darn a patch on a shirt. And to me, it felt like a secret that she was kind of initiating me into. And it was clearly something that very few people seemed to know much about. And even now, I'm in my 60s, a button falls off somebody's shirt, and I say, oh, you know, I've got a needle and thread over here. You would think that I had produced a magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> the, the shock that you can sew a button on and you have the stuff right here uh, is so uh, charming to me, but surprising how few people f feel the agency uh, mm -hmm. and the skill to do something that's, like I said, ubiquitous in the culture. Yeah. That's a, just a wonderful story. And uh, I'm putting together in my own imagination Bapcha and her irascible nature, and yet the meticulous attunement required for her to be the stitcher of the runway garments that had to be perfect. This sewing cannot be hurried. No, I, I would catch her doing this a little bit. I mean, I was a kid, so I wanted to watch cartoons, but out of the corner of my <laughs> eye, it was, all, it was all in the same room. The incredible meditation concentration of her pinning and folding and yes. stitching. It, it was very surgically precise. Yes. It requires great attunement to the thing in itself and of itself, its own nature. I came to sewing as a child, and I'm not altogether clear how, but I started with needlework. And I loved the precision of it. Of course, I had, you know, the typical cross-stitch patterns. But people commented on the carefulness and the precision of the work. Each edge of each stitch has to match exactly. And the back of it cannot be a big, horrible mess either. So there is something about meticulousness and a paying attention and, and going slowly enough that is really at diametric odds with the world we live in today where everything is going uh, you know, at, at quite a, a rapid pace. And I think that rapid pace makes so many things disposable mm. that we've lost even the consciousness of repairing. Now, I know we'll take our expensive cars, you know, to the dealership to have it repaired, although many of us have forgotten or never learned how to change our own oil. But particularly with clothing, if something tears or a seam tears, uh, there are very few people who would imagine that they could just sew that back into a hole. Uh, it winds up going into the bin and something new arrives. So there's something redeeming about having this skill of putting things back together that might have torn or worn out. There is a satisfaction in repairing, and of course the parallel to life and to psychoanalysis and all kinds of things is, is right there in front of us of how do we repair things that have split apart uh, ripped apart, 
gotten a big hole or wound, and that that process too requires carefulness and attention. Uh, <laughs> when our son was a little boy, he had a, a positive, uh, mysterious, astonishing talent for r ripping the knees out of his jeans and ripping elbows out of shirts. Who knows where he got that? I think it was must have been in his DNA. But what I learned is to patch those holes requires something underneath the hole as well as something over the hole. And if you just stitch the edges together, it constricts a place that needs to bend. Mm -hmm. So just all this by way of saying re the reparative uh, aspect of sewing it is not something that happens necessarily just quick and dirty, but repairing is a wonderful motif, if you will, a thread running through this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to be tempted by puns here. I can see that already. I found myself circling around the idea of understanding the fabric that one is repairing. There's this uh, idea called the bias of the fabric. Yes. Which is the natural way that it stretches or doesn't stretch. That the fabric needs to be understood in order to envision the way to repair. Which again is a metaphor for analysis is that it can take a great deal of time to understand someone's psyche before we could even imagine what's missing or how that might be stitched back into place. So the metaphor of the worn out knees and finding the right size, the right kind of the fabric, also when it's being laid out, mm -hmm. the fabric needs to be in a certain position so that when it's put on, it's not bizarrely, you know, pulling in one direction or another. So there's a great sensitivity to to context and sensitivity to the the psychic situation <laughs> at that moment. And we talk in in uh, sewing about ease that when you're putting a, a sleeve on the shoulder of a garment and there's a curve, you have to ease it in. You ha have to really be sensitive to to the fabric, to the curve, to all of that. Um, and it's a lovely image that further illustrates just what you're saying about how do we do that interpersonally? There's a quality of consciousness to sewing in all of its metaphoric applications that's both delicate and concentrated, mm -hmm. can't be too clumsy, and sometimes you need to wear a thimble so you don't, you know, tear your fingers up, especially if you're sewing by hand. And so all of that delicacy, which I do think that we see um, in surgeons. If any of you mm -hmm. have had surgery, we may underappreciate it, but getting stitched back together is an absolute art. And to those of you that have had really unfortunate scars after a surgery, you know, are, are living with the fact that the surgeon was not a good stitcher. It's incredibly important that a surgeon take pride in his stitching. And oftentimes, that's something that they will allow the, a resident or an intern to do, that after the internal repair has been made, that you will, you know, somebody else, an underling, can come in to do the closing up. You know, that's, my dad was a surgeon, and he took great pride, even though it was usually on somebody's abdomen, let's say, for an appendectomy, of, you know, that it wouldn't leave too big a scar. There was an aesthetic here. Mm -hmm. And I recently, just last year, had a little facial surgery, and the person who, who did the stitching uh, very carefully explained there would be a little ridge and it was intentional and 
it was that concept of ease again, uh, to allow the skin to expand. So there was a little ease sewn in, literally. That there is something, uh, the attention here to the aspect of what is living, that a person is here, skin is here. And how do we pay attention to that as the fabric uh, with which we are working? And as you were saying about your dad, that there's a state of consciousness and neurologic integration that goes into stitching. When I used to be an Alexander Technique teacher, and uh, my first office was in Charlottesville, Virginia, and occasionally, to my surprise, some of the medical students would call up for uh, some Alexander Technique lessons because they were experiencing a kind of malcoordination or a trembling in their hands as they were learning how to stitch particularly. And so people would bring in grapefruits oh. uh, because the resistance <laughs> of the skin of the grapefruit was similar to the way that human skin is resistant to cutting. They would bring a whole surgical suite in and I would be working on their head and neck balance and their breath and their how their feet were organized and resting on the floor and how to use their arms in a way that they could have both strength and rhythm and accuracy. And the doctors and surgeons who were teaching them were using language like that. It, it, it's like the language of musicians. And there is a whole art to doing it. Mm -hmm. And when it's not done well, you can see it. And, yeah. and unlike fabric, you can't just rip it back open again and just give it another shot. Yeah. You know, it's there. So it's, uh, sewing is such a wonderful metaphor for a kind of wholeness of whether it repairs or it creates, whether it's on a human being as surgery, um, whether it's a fitting when we have to adjust something brings all of these dynamics of the psyche and the body. We have to use our eyes. We have to use our hands and be meticulous, but we have to be attuned. And it's a wonderful uh, image for what it takes to make a whole garment from hopefully a more whole psyche. I, I love that as we're talking and I'm we're appreciating the quality of consciousness and knowledge and experience and coordination that all go in to the process of sewing. And as you were saying, how it is part of the way that we enter into relationship with our own psyches. You know, central to psychoanalytic work as a whole is the idea that through childhood and through acculturation that parts of the fabric of the natural self are either cut away quite consciously and that might look like having an authority figure tell you that's not okay you need to sit in your chair you can't go running around or you can't say that word or it's time to stop crying, or, you know, this behavior is required, that mm -hmm. behavior is a problem. Mm. So in a sense, there is a very definitive cutting of the fabric, and putting away the quote unquote scraps into the shadow. Mm -hmm. And conforming to a pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Stitch together a, a culturally proved little boy. <laughs> now, we also recognize that's, needs to happen because we have to f have some way of repressing some of our instinctive behavior or else we're going to wind up in a constant war with the culture. But there are all those scraps yeah. <laughs> down there talking to us. <laughs> oh, hopefully later on we can make a quilt out of some of those. But I think you're heading into the realm of uh, persona. Mm -hmm. You know, and it does apply to the idea of making a garment of some kind that we have to cut the fabric and it does have to conform to a to a pattern. 
And, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, in the context of today's topic, of tailoring Mm. and how people go to tailors um you know the the famous one ones are on seville row in london Mm -hmm. and to have a bespoke suit i love that word of something that is just for you it's not ready made not mass produced it will be made just for you then you have a persona in the form of your suit uh, that also really reflects your individuality. You picked out the fabric. You decided whether it would be double-breasted or whatever else. It conforms exactly to your body. Uh, it's not a predetermined size. So that it really goes to this uh, idea of what is persona that is a cultural pattern or a, a mass-produced, ready-made garment pattern. And then how does that reflect our individuality when we have bespoke uh, symbolic and literal garments? It makes me uh, think about the option to have it monogrammed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? That's, like I, that's right. If I order shirts online, there's always a little box that, you know, for $8, we'll monogram <laughs> your initials on the shirt that really personalize it in some fashion and when you were talking also about your introduction to stitching and needlework embroidery is is a way of personalizing yes the fabric that's more explicit where a symbol is literally stitched into the persona and it might have a practical purpose but often it is about expressing something unique There is a call, I think, to creativity, and Jung considered creativity one of five human instincts. So out of only five that he uh, believed were present, creativity is one of them. And it is a way to personalize some mass-produced pair of jeans or a shirt or something else. And I think we... We really are inherently called to embroider our lives. (laughs) And that often is the difference between a a persona that feels ultimately suffocating because it's too generic, it's too culturally bound, versus a persona where at least some percentage of our authentic creativity or uniqueness or even quirkiness is visible and we need that. The, we need to have some amount of our authentic nature stitched into the persona, or else it feels like a straitjacket and mm-hmm. it makes us feel kind of nutty. It also goes to the flip side of embroidery of when we really embroider our lives, we, we can tell stories that make us look better than we really were. <laughs> that can veer right into hyperbole and fabrication. And interesting that we have that word, fabrication. Oh, nice, nice. So both there's a heads and a tails to all of these coins. It makes me think of uh, kind of Instagram celebrities who who go about the world Uh. and, and, you know, curate these very specific images of themselves and their environments that are, like you said, are quite hyperbolic, that everything is exquisite and joyous and sumptuous and, and designed to be enticing and, and envy producing as well. That, which is a way of kind of tailoring Mm -hmm. our presentation to the collective in order to elicit, you know, a certain response and how the rewards for doing that in, increasingly crafty ways can be quite substantial. (laughs) Yes, crafty. (laughs) Crafty. (laughs) I'm thinking about, um, I'm still uh, on the topic of the tailor, Mm. Uh, because even though, as you mentioned in the intro, of all the dreams we have received, none are about sewing, Mm. there are fairy tales and 
mythological sort of representations of tailors. That does exist in our collective psyche. I'm thinking the the classic one is the brave little tailor or seven at one blow, where in the tale, um, this tailor uh, kills seven flies all at once. He makes himself a belt with it says seven in one blow. Of course, people think he's vanquished an enemy, and this, the story goes on and on. And he cleverly kind of goes along with how other people see him, winds up marrying uh, the king's daughter. Uh, she discovers he's just an ordinary little tailor, and then he fabricates, you know, another imagined scene. And, um, of course, winds up uh, living living happily ever after. So there are uh, a a number of images that uh, combine uh, a kind of trickster quality into the image of someone that usually uh, occupies a rather humble place in society. I think that the tailor is a complicated figure in Shakespeare, There are also tailors, and in the Renaissance, or rather French Restoration theater, there are also depictions of tailors, and they're considered kind of suspicious characters. It's such an intimate role, being measured, having access to a naked person in front of you, and then continuing to have this very intimate relationship with the person who's being fitted. So much like hairdressers, you're kind of hearing stories and secrets and there's touching and people are disrobing. So tailors, I think, are associated with shadow a bit because they engage and see a side of people, particularly in times past, that most people wouldn't see. And part of tailoring is to hide our defects. Yes. You know, um, somebody is a bit heavy and uh, tailors come to the rescue and yeah. they've made bodices that can lace you in mm-hmm. and give you an hourglass figure or yeah. jackets that hide a fella's big belly <laughs> makes us look better and it hides our secrets. Oh, yes. But the tailor knows your secret. The tailor knows your secret. Because the tailor is helping you hide it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, I'm thinking about um, the Hans Christian Andersen tale of the Emperor's New Clothes, where the tailor can also expose you, because these tailors carried on and had a theatrical performance about the glorious robes they were creating for, for the king. And, of course, what they did was to expose him. They trick him into thinking he's wearing clothing when he's actually walking around buck naked. <laughs> and I think about, you know, I know women especially of, you know, this idea of, you know, what is becoming? What is flattering? Is this color good on me? Is the fit really right? <laughs> you know, and every woman has asked this question. Does it make my butt look big? <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me also... You know, think about how the stitchers of the world, whether they're Mm -hmm. tailors, clothing designers, both reflect cultural norms, but often slowly nudge cultural norms in a particular direction. Ah. You know, the stitchers of the world move the hemlines of skirts Mm -hmm. up and down, which change people's sense of themselves and how much of them is exposed or hidden. Stitchers are the ones who are moving cleavage out into the open air or uh, making it all obscured. So the stitching in the clothing also reflects these evolutions of cultural values. Yeah, that's an interesting, that goes into such an interesting thing about what, what do we consider beautiful? What do we consider appropriate? What do we want to wear? And if, anyone looks at clothing from 20 years ago or well now it's more than that but do you remember leisure suits for men oh. i wore them as a little boy oh. 
<laughs> Easter well, Sunday well, at my polyester leisure suit. I was spared that, but heaven forfend, I wore crinolines under my skirts when I was in junior high. What is fashion? What do we stitch together? What do we perceive as attractive and beautiful? And of course, you can go back all the way probably to Paleolithic and Neolithic times when people were stitching animal skins together. Mm -hmm. But uh, from utility toward an aesthetic that a whole culture agrees is the aesthetic until designers and stitchers change it silently, unseen. There they are in the background influencing us profoundly. Absolutely. As you were talking, I was thinking about the dance between utility and aesthetic Mm -hmm. relative to clothes. And what was coming into my mind is that for most people, for instance, in the 1920s, clothing was really utility, that whether it fit well, whether or not the shoes were the right size was secondary to the fact that they had utility. Mm -hmm. And as clothing, or rather as the culture became more affluent, as people shifted from the utility to the aesthetic, that was part of the evolution of our capacity to create, to earn the changing environments that we were laboring in, moving, for instance, from a primarily agrarian culture in the 1920s to a much more urban, Mm -hmm. subtle way of earning a living with one's mind or subtle talents, clothing and stitching transformed you're touching on this whole sort of trajectory over history here of of sewing of people in uh when we were really hunter gatherers of there are bone needles using you know rawhide or strips of intestines to sew animal skins together and then growing of flax and cotton and various other fabrics and spinning and weaving and then leaping into, let's say, the Industrial Revolution where now there were factories um, and mills to just create fabric. So, so much for spinning. Um, That went by the boards. And then in the 1840s, sewing machines came along so that and now we have everything is mass produced the stores are filled with items that have been sewn usually overseas uh so you know as we go back to what you were pointing out about utility versus aesthetic we've gotten very distant from sewing as a creative or even utilitarian uh activity it's it's something we don't think about, which is why it may not be present in in dreams or even in our daily awareness. And I think that's right, that we're not exposed to either the image or even the kinesthetic experience of sewing. So the unconscious doesn't yeah. store that in the internal symbolic library. Mm. Although I could imagine that it might come up occasionally as an extraordinary moment because it isn't something that's usually experienced. As you were talking about the evolution of um, mass production, I was thinking about a TV series which was very charming. It's called The Paradise, and it ran uh, 2012 to 13. And it's in that time period where... The Industrial Revolution is really roaring forward, and there's a movement from having your clothing both designed and stitched by the local tailor versus the introduction of department stores and the mass production of clothing, where you might walk right in and buy something off the rack. Before that, it might take weeks for a tailor to both design and stitch and fit a dress, a piece of clothing, that it was a 
an enormous revolution of values that I think is wonderfully demonstrated in, in that series. So when we look at sewing, there seem to be a bunch of stages, all of which could be viewed as a metaphor. There's something to do with patterns and blueprints, which I think we could imagine as uh, archetypes. <laughs> and that somebody needs to bring forward a pattern that then will take hold of the fabric and the minds of the stitchers to make something manifest. It requires several different processes. Again, envisioning it, experimenting by making muslin patterns often. Muslin is very inexpensive mm -hmm. kind of canvas cloth. And that once the design is made in muslin, then it can be experimented on uh, with a, without much cost. And so we have a first um, birthing mm -hmm. of stitching and design in the non-valuable world before it's then committed to with resources and silk and wool and other things that are quite expensive. So there's a testing and trying process in stitching and sewing. There's also a planning that goes on that as somebody is experimenting with manifesting a, a design, a clothing design, one has to figure out what parts come together first, which is very much like an alchemical formula. And if we do it in the wrong way, it can be almost impossible to complete the project, which really involves the kind of geometry. There's a mathematical instinct at the very least, if not a very conscious process that involves planning and ordering of resources. Again, a psychological skill that if we don't have, it, we can wind up in a, a bunch of difficult circumstances. And if it's really thoughtfully done, we can find areas of our lives really organizing in a much more healthy, more useful way. There's also an art in cutting. Again, as one moves from the pattern to the expensive fabric, one has to examine the fabric, and as I said before, the bias. One has to decide where the stressors on the fabric will be before the cutting happens, so that there's an anticipation of how the fabric is going to give, how it's going to hang, how it's going to interact with the body. So there's this extraordinary attunement and the actual cutting process is very meticulous and often quite slow because any mistake that you make with the cutting can skew the whole process, you know, measure twice, cut once. After the cutting, there's the pinning, <laughs> which is this way of bringing parts together, but not with a full commitment, which is very much like dating. <laughs> <laughs> let's pin the relationship together for a little while, but let's not make this permanent yet. Let's just see if the parts line up, see if things are stretching in the right way or the wrong way. And basting. Basting. Better yet, if you're really doing this in a painstaking way. So explain what basting is. Basting is a kind of loose sewing. You use large stitches. Uh, and the fabric will, you know, take shape and become a, a garment or the sleeve on a shoulder, whatever it is. And you really can see exactly um, how it will hang and if it's if it's right, and make the adjustments um, that are needed. So basting stitches are easier to rip out. Oh, they're a snap. And they damage to rip out. the exactly, and they damage the fabric less than a full marriage of the pieces. And when you're basting, you can really uh, do some of the easing that is necessary. You make the stitches a little smaller, a little more precise, get things just, just right. You can shape it better than you can with just pinning. And that metaphor could apply to a thousand yes. um, internal and external processes, yes. which we do instinctively. 
you know, that will lightly sew things together or, or commit to a possibility at first, which is kind of basting it together. You know, I, I'm going to contemplate uh, you know, changing my exercise routine and going to the gym, you know, each morning at 5 a.m., which is something I have basted together. Um, unfortunately, I was unable to really reinforce that seam, make <laughs> it a regular commitment. It was only a basting stitch, uh, which was perhaps a little too easy to unravel. But it is a, it gives us a sense of the various ways that pieces of our lives and our psyche can be temporarily brought together. If it's done consciously, it's a testing process. Mm-hmm. If it's done unconsciously, what we find is that the seam cannot bear the tension of wear. The wear and tear makes a basting seam just fall apart. And boy, we see that a lot in interpersonal relationships. Are you just basted to that friendship or are you have a double seam? <laughs> so it it turns out that sewing is actually a, a really poignant uh, metaphor for many of the processes of, of living and being willing uh, to see that pattern that's there, that's hidden, that is the archetypal dimension. So let's say that it's a relationship. Let's say that it is a calling uh, to do something in the world. And then that very careful part where it needs to be translated into consciousness to become a pattern and to be willing to cut and then try it, baste it, fit it, change it, baste it again uh, before sewing. And then what is it that we decided to use uh, for the final, final garment? What is the fabric we've chosen? And is that appropriate? I mean, we wouldn't choose cotton, for example, for uh, a winter overcoat. Mm-hmm. And neither would we choose wool for uh, undergarments. Uh, so there's a whole process there of, of discerning as well. You know, maybe my my ego wants uh, an overcoat made out of gold lame. Well, that's really not going to work for a winter coat. It's just silly. Right, so there are fanciful ideas yes. that can show up, which, of course, yes. like in Project Runway, for instance, which brought sewing and design into the general consciousness, and then some of the uh, extraordinary <laughs> and strange visions that walk down the runway, which I'm sure we've all seen, and we're thinking, where would you wear that? How would you possibly use this, um, these pants, which are three and a half feet wide and full of some kind of inflatable chambers, uh, and these extraordinary visions that people will bring forward divorced from utility? Divorced from utility, and in that case and maybe in mass production, divorced from taking time. It's all about speed. You have to create this garment because you're, it's due tomorrow. So get the idea, whip it up, and they can, on these shows, I think they can hire stitchers. Uh, so the painstaking operation of actually sewing <laughs> can really get divorced from, from design. If it's going to be a life that we are sewing together, I think we uh, might do well to learn how to stitch. Well, maybe this is a good transition to a dream. In other words, we have sewn this topic up? I think it's all sewn up. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And riding on this metaphor, I'm also thinking about what an interesting lens with which to imagine dream work, that dreams are themselves a fabric that is being offered that we might stitch into consciousness. Sometimes the the patch that's offered is archetypal, a kind of 
um, spiritual fabric that is going to be temporarily stitched into the psyche. And sometimes there is a real embodied capacity that surfaces, which is going to be stitched in in one fashion or another. I want to add, too, that dreams can uh, sometimes give us information that is really uh, applicable to our everyday lives in a very concrete way. So I'm going to quickly tell the story about Isaac Singer, uh, inventor of the famous Singer sewing machine, really stumped by how to get the two threads that are needed in a sewing machine to interlock and to connect with each other. And he had a dream, famously, about a bunch of uh, native people marching in a line, carrying spears that they were holding in their hands straight up and down. But in each spear, there was a hole. And from that dream, he was inspired, and he had the solution to the problem, which is the top sewing machine needle has to have a hole in it for the thread to go through. So you never know with dreams what they may give you, sometimes in surprising ways. Did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self? Dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone. We're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing, balance, insight, and guidance as we make key decisions. At 28, Charles felt lost and isolated. He had a dream that touched him deeply. As he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. During Dream School's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motives that shape your life, reveal unknown facets of your personality, unlock the door to inner wisdom. To enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there. So here is this week's uh, dream uh, from a woman who's 42, and she is um, a CEO in, in the field that's administrative. Here's the dream. I'm walking up a stairwell together with what feels like a close friend of mine, and we enter an apartment which I assume is mine, even though I've never seen it before. The hallway is quite spacious and sterile, there's no furniture or curtains. As we enter, my white pet ferret rushes toward me and wants to be cuddled. I pick her up and hold her in my arms. I'm so happy to see her, but at the same time I feel bad because I know I have neglected her and left her alone in the apartment for far too long. Suddenly, I'm horrified as I notice that she has a large lump on her right eyelid my friend takes the ferret from me and carefully examines her eye. After a while, she says, Look, the lump is covering, covering her eye, and she will go blind if it continues to grow. Actually, you used to have a lump like this on your eye a while ago, but you removed it. She must have caught it from you. It's a virus, you know. I can't recall any of this, but I trust my friend that she is right so I'm instantly relieved. I feel so grateful that we have discovered it in time to save her, and I promise myself to take better care of her in the future. For context, our dreamer says, she is suffering from withdrawal symptoms after discontinuing bipolar medication due to experiencing increasingly bad side effects. Slowly, she says, her physical and mental health is being restored, but there's still a long way to go. The main feelings in the dream were mixed feelings of joy and sadness, familiarity and unfamiliarity, a strong feeling of having forgotten something important, 
great love and trust in my friend, despite not even knowing who she is. And she adds that she used to have a white pet ferret and two black ones in real life about 15 years ago when she was going through a rough breakup and was diagnosed as bipolar, and that that ferret died of cancer shortly after moving house. I really feel that I have um, a tremendous sense of feeling for this dream because once upon a time, so many years ago, I had a dream that I was entering, re-entering my apartment after having been gone for a while, and there on the floor was an orange kitten uh, who had was on the verge of dying because it had been neglected, abandoned, and left for too long. And that dream got my attention in a very powerful way that I think this dream is demanding of the dreamer Mm. of where is that innocent, instinctual life energy uh, that is being forgotten about and neglected. Well, I think that that really, that really speaks to the message that the dream maker is really putting right in her hands, this loving, curious, dynamic part of herself and showing the dream ego that there's some very serious need to attend to it, that something is wrong, something is hurt. But there also is a certain reassurance because the friend is saying, you know, you have consciously had this malady Mm -hmm. and you have solved it, you have known how to solve it. And now this malady is here in the instinctive level of the psyche. And also, you have some capacity to address it on that level too, once you know that it's happening. It's a wonderful image, this image of the friend, uh, a very, very positive, helpful, informative shadow figure who appears um, right at the outset where she's moving into an apartment that she's never seen before, but it's hers. There's no furniture. There are no curtains. It's sterile. So it's a wonderful contrast of what is sterile and unfurnished in in the dreamer's life and unfamiliar. Together with the suffering animal, the very positive and helpful shadow figure, and calling attention to a lump on the eye, (laughs) which... Eyesight is often associated with consciousness. We say all the time, oh, I see your point. You know, I saw where this was going. And as you've pointed out, it's very hopeful because it can be removed. You know what this is. You had it yourself. And this malady, if unrecognized, can cause blindness. Yes, it will occlude the eye. It will swell the eye shut, and we will lack, you should pardon the pun here, bipolar vision or bifocal. I'm not quite grabbing the right word, but we need two eyes in order to see in depth. I think that's really important. So there's an infection that could blind in one eye, which would deprive us of depth vision. And so this could be a defense that the dreamer has implemented that might have been useful to her initially. Sometimes when our ego is not strong enough, the unconscious will occlude what's going on, will prevent us from perceiving it too deeply. And now, with the dream, there's a suggestion that she's already done some work 
to be able to clear up the deeper vision. And now there's a deeper opportunity when the vision is cleared up. It'll be interesting to see what's possible that might not have been possible before. And the ferret is such a wonderful symbol because it ferrets things exactly. out. Exactly. It goes into the tiny, yes, exactly. tiny holes under the furniture. Mm -hmm. And ferrets um, have been our companions apparently for a long time. They were domesticated about 2,500 years ago. Oh my gosh. And they were used to hunt rabbits and rodents. They would very courageously just jump right down into these animal dens and chase the rabbits and rodents out of the burrows. Right around the 1800s, they were widely used in the American West to protect grain stores from rodents. Oh which my was goodness! An incredibly important thing. And I remember a uh, a friend of mine many many years ago. She was raised in the English countryside. And she had this memory of an old farmer that lived near them, and she was also raised on a farm, who would keep his pet ferrets in his pockets. When he got to the barn, he would take them out, but he would have them tethered to him on these long strings so that he could kind of retrieve them and they wouldn't run off. And there was something so charming and creative and uh, innovative about that whole image and she's telling me the story and she would burst into gales of delight as she remembered these ferrets and their good nature to submit to that they were emissaries they were emissaries <laughs> friendly companions the name ferret comes from a latin word which means little thief oh and this may come from the idea that ferrets like to take little things and hide them away. And it's probably an instinct about food items, but as they've been domesticated, it could be any small thing they could get their hands on and then hide it somewhere else. In the psyche, in this dream, uh, the, the ferret has that role of, as you say, we all say, ferreting things out, of what needs to be ferreted out uh, for this dreamer. And maybe she could, you know, tie that string around a ferret and, uh, and really look at it and see more closely what needs to be retrieved, what needs to be unearthed, ferreted. It's interesting that that is the animal that the that Psyche has chosen and that she has ferrets in her life because it it fits perfectly um, a, as a symbolic function in the dream. It reminds me of that oh, charming book series and now television series, His Dark Materials uh, and the uh, the Golden Compass, where everyone is assigned a daimon, which is a Tihawking creature, an animal, and the heroine Lyra, her daimon, her soul image, is often a ferret. That is part of her own capacity to ferret out secrets and to nimbly move unseen and safely in this very complicated and often dangerous world. I'm thinking, too, about how this dream has in it a, a lot of bipolarity. This is a white ferret in the dream. Our dreamer used to have a white one and two black ferrets in real life of what is seen, what is not seen, what has been neglected, what is loved. And that she has added uh, that she's uh, gone off uh, medication for bipolar disorder. She seems to have a, a pretty demanding, responsible job that has some status. And how do we connect through a symbolic ferret that is cared for and not neglected? How do we ferret out and weave together all these various aspects of a life? And I think that really, in my experience, holds very true 
for uh, bipolar disorder is the interplay of consciousness and objective stance toward what am I doing, where am I doing it, why am I doing it, um, as well as the feeling function uh, that that is really you know such a feature of bipolar disorder. How do you put that to use? instead of neglecting some part of it as if it's in an unfurnished apartment, or on the other hand, letting it control uh, life. And where in her life does she have this marvelous friend, the intermediary, who she doesn't know, but who gives her the instructions? Here's what you do. It's a virus. You've had it. It's curable. You know what it is. I'm familiar with uh, Lamictal, which is the medication that she's weaning mm-hmm. off of. And uh, it can be a very effective mood stabilizer, but it's known to have very strong side effects. And the side effects are often blurred vision, double vision, clumsiness, unsteadiness. And then we have a ferret (laughs) whose vision is being compromised. So her feeling that the lamictal is causing a problem, particularly in the body, and often animals represent the body, the instinctive level. So I think the dream is in some ways confirming that this medication, you know, is, is having some troublesome effects and also it's not uncommon for people who are bipolar and accustomed to a very rich intense emotional experiences they go on medication and they are troubled that their emotional life feels white sterile clinical organized now by the way there is a great benefit to that i'm not suggesting necessarily that anybody go off their medication because when people are in severe bipolar episodes, they can, they can create a lot of problems for themselves during an episode. And also decreasing medication is as much of an art as starting it. Often these things need to be uh, titrated slowly down. But I can understand the psyche talking to her about yes. the side effects, the sterilization of the emotional life, mm-hmm. and at the very least bringing consciousness to it. Dreams very rarely tell us what to do, but they are always asking us what to look at. Yeah. And then it's still up to the ego to discern how it mm-hmm. may or may not want to operationalize yeah. what it then is looking at. I, I think that um, it is exactly it, is to look at Uh, the ferret, and what needs to be tended to as a bodily image, a creature that is very agile and serviceable, (laughs) but it has to be able to see. And and where is a dynamic like that in your life? Where is there a shadow friend? And where and how are you living in a new space that is unfurnished now, but has promise? The ferret also can be, or could be, a symbol for the manic episode. When I've seen ferrets, and they're really excited, Mm -hmm. they're very, very fast, they're um, very, very cunning, they're funny, they're hilarious, they're playful, they roll around like puppies sometimes, they'll jump up your pants legs (laughs) if you let them. it's it's a lot of high spirited, very quick, mercurial yeah. kind of energies, and sometimes that can be very euphoric. So again, as I've had clients and friends, for that matter, who struggle with bipolar phenomena, the beginning of the manic episode can be very ferret like and euphoric, and playful and hilarious and. Mm-hmm. Maybe they can get an enormous amount of work done because they have so much energy in their uh, brain. And if it goes too far, and then people become sleep-deprived, they become unwell, they're vulnerable to hallucinating. 
They get depressed. And on the other side, the depression, I'm, I'm thinking that if the frit um, is some statement about the phenomena of the disorder, it leans me more towards that manic pull rather than the depressed. But yes, people can also swing between crippling, mm -hmm. burdensome depression. Uh, and the image of this, uh, the, the ferret that's been neglected, you know, might point to the depressive side of this disorder. So I hope that the dreamer is being very thoughtful about slowly shifting medications. I hope very much that this is under the care of her prescriber, her psychiatrist. I hope that there are also friends who can provide feedback as to how she is functioning, because often when we swing up or down um, in, with a bipolar struggle, the brain, which is the organ of self-perception, is affected. So sometimes it's difficult for us to realize that we've suddenly changed our behavior quite dramatically, and we may need the help of a trusted friend to just mirror our own experience. And bipolar medication often takes quite a while to work, to restabilize. So hopefully for this person, she's receiving adequate care and oversight, and also there are other options for treatment that have been identified. Yes. And there isn't um, a total abandonment of treatment because that can be really problematic for all the reasons we've inferred. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.